Okay, thank you. More on dwarf galaxies, uh, the uh, celebrities of the Hubble sequence. Uh, they have been challenging our understanding uh, of the mapping between dark matter halos and the, uh, uh, you know, and their baryonic uh, component uh, for almost two decades. So, so this is going to be a very similar talk uh, to the one you just heard. Uh, I'm going to talk about high resolution simulations of dwarf galaxies. Uh, try to show you. Uh, you know, what's the state of the art, uh, how we can compare with the amount of, of, of data and observations that have been uh, emerging over the last uh, uh, few years or so, and also what type of simulation we would like perhaps to reproduce with more codes uh, and, uh, and using, for example, the Agora initial conditions. Uh, again, uh, the standard uh, problem uh, with, uh, with uh, CDM versus dwarfs. Uh, an abundance mismatch, which requires the dwarfs uh, to be forming stars with very small uh, star formation efficiencies, which is something that is difficult to reproduce in numerical simulation that has uh, given rise to a field problem as well as a missing satellite problem. And then there is a structural mismatch, which is the CASP core problem, which is also uh, which becomes uh, the too big to fail problems. Uh, the two may be associated. And that basically is the fact, as you can see uh, there, that in N body simulations, uh, the most massive subhalos or Milky Way type of galaxies have rotation curves uh, of, of uh, circular velocity profiles uh, that are much higher than what we infer uh, from the dwarf satellites of our own Milky Way. Uh, an attractive solution to all this problem involves baryons. Uh, you heard it uh, already in the previous talk. Uh, the advantage of using baryonic uh, processes is that we don't have to change the properties of the dark matter. Every time we do that, we have to add a free parameter, uh, like a cutoff in the power spectrum uh, or a self-interacting uh, cross-section. Uh, the problem is the capturing uh, the baryonic and, and, uh, and feedback processes, which regulate the metabolism of the dwarf galaxies, it's hard. It takes high resolution simulations. You expect gas in such low uh, metallicity system never to settle down into a thin disk, uh, thin cold disk, and that means the uh, shallow potential well of this system will make the ISM more prone to disruption by supernovae. Uh, if that's the case, you expect star formation to be bursty, and that's a process you want to, you would like to. Uh, reproduce. Uh, that's not what we see in more massive systems. So you would expect uh, once you disrupt the ISM uh, with supernovae, uh, the star formation to be bursty. You expect stellar feedback to drive galactic outflows uh, that will modulate the stellar buildup, the gas fraction, and alter the chemical uh, uh, evolution of your systems. And all of this must be uh, put out. Uh, put in into your computer in some way or the other. So let me show you simulation run with uh, gasoline. This is a group of seven uh, dwarf run down to C equals zero. It's an LCDM uh, SPH simulation run down to uh, Z equals zero with this resolution, uh, dark matter mass uh, 0.1.6 uh, times 10 to the four solar masses. Uh, the stellar mass goes down to 1,000 solar masses. The softening, uh, it's 80 physical parsec. Uh, we resolve uh, hydro forces uh, with a kernel that is 10 times as small as that. We include metal-dependent gas cooling, ultraviolet background heating and photoionization. And we use a high uh, star formation density threshold uh, of about 100 particles per cubic centimeter. So the resolution is high enough we can form stars in the dense region that, that you would, where you would expect uh, star formation to occur. Uh, the uh, uh, star formation rate follows uh, a local Schmidt law where it's proportional to the gas density to the 3 half. And, uh, and uh, at this type of resolution, basically, you can resolve the gene's length of gas at this threshold, 100 particles per cubic centimeter, and temperature as low as 1,000 Kelvin or so. So uh, seven dwarfs, that makes uh, the uh, naming uh, convention a little bit uh, uh, easier. Uh, before I go that, let me tell you how we inject energy. Uh, the, the only feedback mechanism that we have is supernovae. We inject 10 to the 51 ergs uh, for every supernova um, into the nearest uh, neighbor's particle. Supernova feedback uh, as a scheme which produces galactic outflows. 
uh, and that scheme basically uh, includes a shot of cooling. We, sh we shot of cooling uh, for the duration of the blast. The reason is if you don't do that, uh, you heard that already uh, during this uh, workshop, but if you don't do that, you're basically putting your supernova energy into an SPH particle that is too fat, and that means you drive the temperature of that SPH particle to 10 to the 5 Kelvin instead of 10 to the 7 Kelvin, and that particle will cool down immediately. So a, a tiny fraction of the energy that you put in is going to go into kinetic energy, which is not what you want to do, and that's why you, we shut off cooling for time scale that are of order 10 to the 7 years. Another way to look at it is, uh, in this type of simulation, you never resolve the set of Taylor uh, uh, part of the uh, phase of the supernova blast, uh, and so somehow you have to arbitrarily increase the kinetic energy that is injected into the uh, ISM. Um, this is a minimalistic type of feedback as well. Uh, it's uh, interesting to compare that with uh, what other people do. We don't have explicit wind particles, we don't have mass loading, we don't have metal uh, loading put by hand, we don't have uh, two-phase subgrid ISM, we don't have AGN feedback, uh, we don't decouple the hydro. Okay, that's the only thing we do. We shut off cooling uh, and let everything evolve. Of course, that means we don't have a lot of, uh, perhaps not as much physics, that we like uh, to have, on the other hand, the number of free parameters uh, that we have is also small compared to what other people do. Uh, as I was telling you, the uh, seven dwarfs uh, in the field that we can resolve well, that, that makes the naming convention uh, easy. So we have uh, seven of them from bashful, dog, dopey, uh, grumpy, happy, sleepy, and sneezy. If you're not familiar with that, you should go back uh, and, and, and see uh, more uh, Walt Disney movies. Um, is this easy to be the one with the most uh, No, this is just, this is, no, it's just uh, alphabetic. <laughs> in fact, in fact, as you can, as you can tell, Sneezy doesn't even have uh, stars, okay? So that's, uh, that was chosen to be alphabetic uh, and, uh, and in decreasing order of virial masses. So we have seven dwarfs, their masses, range between 4 10 to the 10 down to 4 uh, 10 to the 8 with a radii between 85 and 20. This is all as equal 0. Circular velocity is between 13 and 50 kilometers per second. Uh, they have stellar masses between few by 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 8. Uh, plenty of H1 as you're going to see in a moment. And luminosities uh, ranges between minus 8.6 and minus 15. Uh, point 0.5 or so. Uh, remember only the top four of, this, of those uh, systems in fact are able to form stars and I'm going to go back to that issue in a moment. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was for your amusement. Star formation inefficiency. Let's look how we do when we compare that uh, to the stellar mass viral mass relationship. Uh, this is from a recent paper uh, by Peter uh, Beruzzi. These are our four dwarfs. Uh, the two more massive ones, uh, above 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses, um, have basically the right star formation efficiency. Efficiency is following this curve. Uh, as you go down to lower masses, in fact, we fall well below the extrapolation of that. The star formation efficiencies are strongly modulated uh, by the depth of the potential well. Notice there are two dwarfs here, the uh, virial masses, uh, this and this one. The virial masses are, um, you know, the same to within a factor of three or so. However, the star formation efficiencies uh, are lower or are different by about two orders of magnitude. Uh, the three uh, dwarfs uh, with masses less than 10 to the 9 solar masses or so are unable uh, to form stars. Basically, their gas never gets down to 100 particles per cubic centimeter, which is our threshold for star formation. Um, as I was telling you, uh, out of seven dwarfs, uh, at least three are dark, dark galaxies. Uh, we've done recently another uh, type of simulation using a different type of code. Uh, which is ENSO, and a different type of star formation prescription, uh, instead of driven by the density of the gas, being driven uh, by the molecular fraction, a much bigger box, uh, at, at comparable resolution. Of course, the price to pay is that we haven't run down, down 
down to z equals zero. This is a 2.5. This is a recent paper by Kulin et al. You see the same plot, star formation efficiency uh, versus uh, halo mass, and again a bunch of the dwarf galaxies which are not forming stars or are forming stars with very small efficiency and very long depletion time scales. Okay, so we find uh, different prescription, different type of code, but as you go down to below 10 to the 10 solar masses or so, a lot of those dwarfs are in fact seem to be unable uh, to form stars with, with, uh, with star formation efficiency uh, larger than 0.1% uh, or so. So those are the dark galaxies which we heard uh, already. Let's look at the cold gas fraction. This is just uh, to show you, uh, you know, the number of, of information that is out there. Uh, this is um, MH1 uh, versus stellar mass uh, from the Alpha Alpha uh, survey. Uh, this is a paper by Huang et al. in 2012. Here you have Leo P, which is a recent uh, system uh, found uh, in this survey. has got a high H1 content, very small stellar content, and very small metallicities. Our four dwarfs, in fact are lining up there. And one issue that is important to stress is that the low star formation efficiency clearly are not the results of blowing away all the baryons from the host potential. Well, these are gas-rich systems. As you can see, uh, these two systems, uh, Dopey and Grampy, uh, have typical MH1 over M stars that exceed 1. So there is still a lot of H1 in those systems. It's just not able to form stars because that gas is not cooling down to low temperature and high densities, like uh, you know, 100 particles per cubic centimeter or so. So uh, baryons are retained in these systems. They are not, uh, you know, we are not uh, blowing away all the baryons or blowing out all the baryons from the system themselves. They are retained into those systems, uh, but it's just uh, they never get down to those high densities, uh, and so the star formation efficiencies are relatively low. Uh, there is a lot of information out there on resolved uh, star formation histories. Uh, these are results from the angst survey uh, for dwarf uh, irregulars. And basically you have resolved uh, you know, color magnitude diagrams like the one I'm showing here. This is not a simulation. These are real data. This is DO06. Uh, uh, and from that, you can derive a cumulative star formation history plotted here as a function of redshift versus time. The gray lines are the individual dwarfs uh, from this sample, and, uh, and the color one are bashful and dot, which are our, our most massive uh, dwarfs, the two dwarf systems that have masses closest to 10 to the 10 or so. And you can see we do a relatively good job in reproducing the data. There is no evidence in the simulation for overproducing the amount of stars at early time. You heard that already uh, mentioned a few times here. When you run simulations, typically you produce too many early stars. On more massive system, systems, on these mass scales, we don't find that. In fact, we know that dwarfs have a fraction, a large fraction of these stars. This is 50% of these stars in the data uh, formed, say, below um, you know, redshift. Uh, three or so, uh, and, uh, and if at all, our simulation seems to have a deficit of, of old star compared to the data. Uh, in our case, uh, there is not enough star formation there. It could be UV background, for example. That is, uh, it could be resolution. Again, at those early times, those systems are not large enough. Um, it could be UV background. The other thing to remember is that, of course, uh, the error bars in the data at those early times are huge. Okay, so we still don't know. It's, uh, it'll be interesting uh, to to do more simulation and compare to see uh, if there is a, a real issue there. Two of our systems uh, here. Uh, these are uh, the uh, intermediate mass systems. They have masses about 10 to the 9. Or so they form stars relatively late. Their gas shown here, this is the maximum gas density for those two dwarfs as a function of look back time. At early time, they never get uh, 200 uh, particles per cubic centi centimeter, so they don't form stars. They do so at late time only because of interactions. So that's another mechanism for triggering star formations in systems that otherwise would be too fluffy to form stars. It's only when those dwarfs get close to each other uh, and are close to merge or interacting. You funnel a lot of gas 
following that interaction into the center, you get high density here and you get a star, forming, star formation cycle in those systems too. Um, and uh, uh, those, those two galaxies have properties that resemble the properties of low metallicity um, blue compact dwarfs as, as you know, I found without knowing uh, just by doing some Google search um, um, you know, observers uh, seems to find evidence for young, cosmologically young uh, dwarfs uh, that form star relatively late and containing a small, if not, and I'm reading uh, from that abstract, a small mass fraction of ancient stars. Okay, and again, uh, they also uh, suspect that the reason for that is interaction in groups of dwarfs at late time. The star formation histories are very bursty. Uh, I'm showing those uh, here. This is specific star formation rate as a function of time for our four dwarfs. Uh, and I looked at those and you can see the specific star formation rate that exceeds in these units factor 100 giga year to the minus one or so. And that's, you know, totally out of the uh, uh, realm for uh, normal, more massive galaxies which have typical specific star formation history of, of, of rates, sorry, of one or two in these units, giga year minus one. So I looked at that and I said I was very worried. Uh, you know, do we have any evidence for that happening? And I found out in fact that uh, there is a paper by the Candle survey uh, where they found evidence for a lot of uh, extreme emission line galaxies in candles, uh, broadband selected, a redshift greater than one. These are systems uh, with oxygen lines uh, with rest frame equivalent widths that are larger than a thousand angstrom or so. Uh, and I'm reading from this abstract. Here we conclude that these objects are dwarf galaxies, 10 to the 8 solar masses in stellar mass, undergoing an enormous starburst phase. Uh, this burst uh, may cause outflows, which are strong enough to produce cores. The individual star formation rate and commoving number density can produce in four giga year much of the stellar mass density that is presently contained in the dwarfs. This observation provides strong indication that many of even most of the stars in present uh, day dwarfs are formed in strong bursts. Okay, so if you do simulations of, of dwarfs, you might want to keep this in mind and trying to reproduce the burst the star formation history uh, that people are starting to observe, uh, at least at high redshift. Um, these dwarfs are metal polluters, uh, and this has already been mentioned uh, by Xi Jin uh, Shen. Uh, yesterday, that's the metal bubble as equal zero that surround those dwarfs. These are Vira radii as equal zero, and you can see the metals have been spread uh, over uh, uh, this, the size of this region is three megaparsec or so. Okay, so those metals have been ejected over a region that it's about 16 times the Vira radius of uh, Bashful, a large uh, mass loading factor between 10 of 20 or so. And again, this is interesting uh, because we can start comparing uh, our, uh, met the, uh, the uh, ionic abundances of all these metals as a function of Inca impact parameter with observation of sub L star system as equal zero, which is something that uh, we haven't done yet. Uh, most of the metals are ejected, so these are metal poor systems. I was worried we'd not be able to sit on the mass metallicity relationship. We do it well instead. This is again a gas phase metallicity as a function of stellar mass. This is uh, stellar metallicity as a function of luminosity is again data. Uh, these are uh, local uh, dwarfs. Uh, these are field dwarfs. And again, those are our simulation. We seem to be able uh, to at least sit on those relationships uh, without uh, much problem. Uh, there is more information there you might want to compare if you have simulations of this uh, resolution. These are um, stellar metallicity distribution function. Uh, the uh, color uh, is the simulation. These are two of our dwarfs, Bashful and Grampy. Uh, the uh, the uh, you know black points are the data for two uh, dwarf systems which happen to have the same average metallicity. I don't want to make a lot of these comparisons, just to show that the distribution of metallicities that we find is not too different than that what observers um, 
find, actually. Okay, so uh, there seems to be a decent distribution of metallicity, and of course, this is giving you information uh, about the entire star formation and chemical evolution history of those systems, as, as opposed just to the mean metallicity. Uh, cores, uh, and I'm going to stop uh, here. Yes, we do have cores. Uh, that's because uh, we have outflows that produce cores. Uh, this is the slope of the dark matter density profile versus stellar mass measured at 500 parsec and z equal zero for our four luminous dwarfs versus things galaxies. This is the stellar mass. Uh, that's the slope of the profile. An NFW profile would have a slope of about minus one here and then drop uh, down as we go to smaller stellar masses. And so uh, the luminous dwarfs have cores, uh, large cores, in fact. I'm going to show you uh, those in a moment. And as you go to fainter magnitude, there are not enough stars and enough outflows to create large cores. And this system has steeper profiles. And also we run down uh, of resolution. Another way to plot it is to plot the slope of the mass profile gamma. This is d log m over d log r as a function of radius uh, for those simulated dwarfs. Uh, so gamma would be less than minus three, that three uh, for NFW and less than two for a core profile. And these are our four dwarfs, the two luminous one F cores. They're closer to uh, gamma equal three. And this is the value that is found in, in two dwarfs, uh, Fornax and Sculptor. Uh, by Peneruba et al. And these systems have, in fact, luminosities, stellar luminosities that are comparable to our dwarfs. I realized this that I might have switched it. Uh, gamma equal three uh, means core, and gamma equal two uh, means NFW. Uh, again, you don't have to do fancy analysis to see those cores. Those are the dark matter density profiles for our system as a function of redshift. Again, as equal zero, you can see the size of those cores. Uh, too big to fail, again, uh, just, just uh, one mention about this, because our systems have cores, their uh, velocity profiles, in fact, even for large maximum circular velocities, their velocity profile are relatively shallow. And so here we have a VMAX system, this is bashful, has got a VMAX of 51 km per second, which is re reached at large distances. These are circular velocities uh, as a function of, of radius again. And you can see these are the data for the local dwarfs. And again, I don't see here uh, much of a too big to fail problem. Big systems produce stars, those stars trigger outflows, outflows produce cores. And so within you know, one kiloparsec from the center, all these systems have circular velocities that are less than 20 kilometers per second or so. Done. All right. Thank you. One or two quick questions. What the barons do? Yes. So from your uh, Yes. Yes, but those bar yeah, the outflows are metal rich. Okay. So the baryon fraction, I think it has been mentioned asked before, what's the baryon fraction of this system? It's about one percent. And there is still a lot of H one which is consistent with the data. So there is gas that is retained in this system. And, uh, and for the most massive one, as much as 80% of the metals is ejected. So you are, you are ejecting preferentially metals as opposed to gas. One more question. Kelly. So it seems like uh, for the more virgin is fairly important on actually where you said the pressure for star formation. Uh, can you remind us how is that uh, chosen and if that's a uh, robust uh, so you want, to, you want to know whether we converged and uh, whether we run more simulation, about 100? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like uh, for, for We use 100 because we can resolve it. We can resolve the genes length associated with it. We use 100 because uh, the governato 
2010 dwarfs run a couple of years ago use, had 100 and it formed core. So the idea here was, was to try to reproduce that and as well as study the impact of outflows on the gas and metallicity content, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we cannot go at this resolution above 100. Uh, and so, you know, I can't, I can't claim that we have converged. 